Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Washington Ocheng. Uh, I'm the current head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Imperial College. A very, very warm welcome to you all. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our department for the 47th annual Pavius Lecture. And it's great to see uh, many of our students here and a special mention to the Arkwright scholars who are joining us today. Now, due to the popularity of this event, and it is very popular, more people registered for the lecture than seats in this room, even though you can see a few empty ones, but that is true. And so the lecture is being live streamed also to another room, 163, which is just out there. So whichever room you're in, if our evacuation alarm goes, uh, please leave the room and make your way out of the main entrance of the building, uh, turn right and congregate next to the new statue that we have out there to your right. Okay. Um, the organization of this annual lecture is a joint effort between our department, the Worship of Company of Pavius, and the Institution of Civil Engineers, the ICE. And it is now my privilege to introduce the master of the Worshipful Company of Pavius, Mr. Neil Sundberg, uh, to tell us a little bit more about the Pavius and to introduce our speaker. But before he steps forward, I'd like to say a few words about Neil. So he graduated from that other university. Um, I, think, I think it's called Exeter from what's written here. Probably. And, and I, I would have something to say about that. Um, he joined Morlim to work on various projects, including London City Airport. He spent some time on secondment to Arab before moving to the United States of America. While in the USA, he worked with Grenier, large American com consulting company, uh, and now part of the URS group. Neil then returned to the UK in 1992 and joined Sundberg, working as an engineer in the construction materials department. After two years there, he moved to Hong Kong to manage Sundberg Asia Limited. And the projects that he works on are well known. They include Ting Kao Bridge and Hong Kong Housing Architect Authority Schemes. He then returned to the UK in 1996 to manage Sunberg's civil engineering group, an operation responsible for site-based laboratories worldwide. In 2000, he became a managing partner in Sunberg. In 2008, Neil was elected chairman of Association for Consultancy and Engineering. He was elected as council member of the ICE in 2011 and in 2012, he joined the ICE's executive board. So a very illustrious career that's still continuing. So Neil, it's now my privilege and honor to request you to speak briefly about the Pavius and introduce our speaker. A round of applause for Neil, please. I don't recognize any of that, but thank you very much, Washington. Very, very kind and not deserved. But you will see I am an engineer through and through. So I'm really pleased to be back at Imperial, where I did um, a master's. It wasn't engineering, it was an MBA, but it's lovely to be back. So tonight, um, let me just do a very brief introduction about the Paviors before we get to our real reason for being here. Pavia's uh, a livery company going back to 1276. Now that's pretty extraordinary. And in 1276, like Imperial, a big part of what we were doing was education. We were helping people develop the skill of building roads. So we would have apprentices who were bound to a master for seven years. At the end of that, they would then be able to train other apprentices. So there's a theme of education throughout throughout today. I would also like to say 
that as our warm-up act, I gather, there are some um, significant visitors to Imperial. I heard today we, we might have Bill Gates, your warm-up act, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly even Rishi Sunak. But it was all kept secret. That was what I heard from outside. So that's quite a warm-up act. Um, Mark very kindly has agreed to put this on. Um, what a topical subject for our world. Um, the plan is he's going to speak, then um, he's kindly agreed to take questions for perhaps 20 minutes, and we'll be able to take questions um, from this floor. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do them from the room next door, but maybe you could sneak in here if there are chairs spare, if you've got something burning. Um, and then there'll be drinks upstairs. Uh, Miles Ashley has, has done an amazing job organising this, including getting in many businesses to showcase some of their stuff, which will be going on later as well. So if you want to be involved in that, please go upstairs and have a look at, at them. They would love to see your interest. That's enough from me for now. If you've got questions about the paviors, come and see me afterwards. Um, it's now for me to ask Mark to come and give his 47th paviors lecture. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. And uh, thank you uh, to the Paviors for inviting me. Um, I was just thinking, with that um, amazing history going back to, to 1276, um, clearly what you have done has been kind of built on tradition and has, um, has moved us forward. There's always been a future. Uh, in those nearly 750 years. And I guess part of what uh, I'm keen to do just now um, is point forwards, imagining that there will be at least another good 750 years in the paviors. Um, but clearly, in those 750 years, uh, there will be some kind of change. Uh, and so I'd be quite interested to explore part of what that might look like. Uh, so we have this subject of enabling data and digital transformation. Uh, and I thought that what I would do um, is break it up into um, three key areas, um, starting at a very high level in order to provide some, some context. Uh, and so what I'll be doing there is defining some terms uh, so that uh, you know, we're all on the same page when I'm saying this, that the, uh, talking about the built environment uh, in that, that big picture context. Uh, but then what I'll do um, is dig into data and digital transformation itself, um, hopefully in the context of the wider built environment. Uh, but my point there will be to try and make a case for data and digital transformation. Uh, and then I'll dig in a little bit more uh, and uh, introduce the subject of digital twins and connected digital twins, uh, which is really providing an example of a joined up solution, something that would fit within the wider uh, digital uh, transformation strategy. So that's the, that's the idea, starting very broad, but then, then zooming in. So starting at that, that kind of widest level and, and introducing some terms, what, what do I mean by the built environment? So the built environment, I think, is um, an amazing thing. Uh, it's something that we've been building for hundreds of years. Uh, it's got all sorts of interesting layers which are interconnected, uh, including the economic infrastructure. So in the economic infrastructure, we've got our energy and transport and water and telecoms uh, and waste. Each one of those is complex in itself, but they're connected to each other. And so we have this kind of amazing system of connections. But that's not the whole story because we also have our social infrastructure. So in our social infrastructure, it includes our hospitals and prisons and schools and the stuff that goes on within those, but also um, commercial, industrial, residential buildings, none of which work unless they're connected up to the economic infrastructure. So we've got more connections. And then that's not the end of the story. We've also got um, our natural environment and the interface uh, between the built environment and the natural environment. Uh, and the natural environment itself is complex and interconnected. So when you add all of those things together, you get the built environment. So that's, that's what I'd like us to consider here. It's the, it's the whole thing, this whole amazing thing um, that we live inside. And I think sometimes we don't notice it. It's almost hiding in plain sight uh, because it's kind of so obvious we live in it. 
Uh, but it's kind of important because our society depends on it. You know, if, if this doesn't work, then society doesn't work. Uh, it's really important. And so what I would like to say on this is that uh, the built environment is a system of systems. It's just a description of it. Because we've got these complex interconnected systems, it means that it is a system of systems. And we'll talk about systems and how to understand them as, as we go through. Uh, but the thing is, we've got this amazing complex interconnected system of systems, but the way that we choose to run it very often is in silos. And quite often those silos don't talk to each other. And so we have a, the beginning of a bit of a problem here, that we've got a complex interconnected system being run um, by governance and organizations uh, that are not so well interconnected. Um, and that's not all when it comes to the problems and how to get the best out of our built environment, um, because there are big challenges, huge cross-sector, um, cross-system challenges, uh, not least of which is climate change. But I think the thing uh, to point out here is that all these big challenges affect all of the systems. They don't just happen in silos. Uh, and so if we look at this kind of set of problems and the things which we have to address, they're all in some ways connected because they're all system level challenges, which therefore demand system based solutions. And so if we want to achieve net zero, we can't do that in silos. It's the same with providing climate resilience. Resilience is something that can only come from the whole system. The same thing with delivering infrastructure, infrastructure equity, creating a circular economy. You know, all of these things are desirable. We want to do those. Um, if we look at the other side of the coin, we can see them as threats. But really what I wanted to do is point to a way that we can address these. Uh, but the only way that we can address them um, is by considering the whole system. We cannot address it in silos. So, with that context, we now know what I'm meaning when I'm saying built environment. We now also know that I'm talking about the whole, the whole system. I want to say that the built environment really does matter. Uh, so it was a year and a half ago um, that we crossed a tipping point where the total mass of the built environment exceeded the total biomass. So all plants, all people, all animals, all bacteria, you add all of that up, um, the built environment now weighs more than that. So what we're building is seriously encroaching um, on the planet. Another kind of tipping point um, is that over 50% of carbon emissions is related to the built environment. Another thing is that the built environment is the biggest user of natural resources. Out of anything, out of any human activity, the built environment is the biggest user of natural resources. So what I want to kind of say here is that the built environment matters. Uh, and all of those things sound a little bit like threats and negative. Um, but I also want to turn to the positive of what the built environment can do for us. You know, the positive thriving that we can get when the built environment is working well. So I'm not just coming at this of, you know, oh, it's all doom and gloom and threat. I think we have to take that seriously, uh, but there's more than that. Uh, and because the built environment matters, uh, that means that we also matter. So for us who work in the built environment, in whatever capacity, whether that's delivering new assets into the built environment, or operating or maintaining the built environment, uh, or helping with planning so that what we build in the future is better, you know, all of us who work in this built environment really matter. You know, it's not just a case of kind of going to work to, to do a job. Uh, this is a job uh, that matters to society because the built environment matters to society. And we have an influence on those big global system level challenges. So I know sometimes we kind of can feel small and what can I do? I want to say we're part of a system as well uh, and we can make a difference and we must make a difference. So we in this room matter. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, 
I think that when we look at the built environment this way, and we also look at ourselves as having agency, that we can make a difference, we're not just kind of subject to the winds of fortune, uh, then it becomes really important to have a vision for the built environment. And I think that that vision has to be outcomes focused. Um, there is a vision, um, Google it, it's a good one. Uh, and that, that vision, which is shared across a number of cross um, built environment organizations um, articulates it in those terms that, that the, the um, built environment should have a purpose and the purpose of the built environment is all about enabling people and nature to flourish together for generations. So I think there's quite a few nice things in there. You know, there's there's the, the people part, because that matters, you know, we matter, but also nature. It's kind of seeing that the built environment affects nature. We should purposefully look for better outcomes for nature as well. Um, and the word flourish, I think, is good too, because that's not just about kind of a narrow definition of wealth. It's a much more broad thing where you, know, you flourish and it's about well-being uh, and flourishing together for generations. So not just for now, but thinking about those future generations. So there's quite a lot packed in there. But the important thing for me um, is seeing that the built environment can have a purpose and therefore we have a purpose in helping that to be achieved. And now that might sound to some of you uh, like it's just kind of airy fairy visionary nonsense. Um, it's really not because it's been built uh, directly into UK government policy. Uh, and I'd invite you to do a little bit of a cross comparison. You look at that, uh, that vision, look at transforming infrastructure performance roadmap to 2030 uh, and see the similarities. And so this is, I think, really encouraging. It means that we don't just have a vision, but that's now being turned into policy, which then means we can turn it into strategy and action in order to achieve the vision. So this already is hopeful. So systems and also agency, us working together. So if we take this approach, if we, if we buy the, the fact that the built environment has a purpose uh, and it's an outcomes focused purpose, it's all about better outcomes for people and nature, um, then I think it's instructive for us to see how we get to those better outcomes. You know, how, how, where do they come from? Um, and so I put the outcomes on the right hand side. It's kind of starting with the end in mind. Um, part of what is intended by this way of setting it out is to indicate that at the top you can have global high level outcomes which are desirable articulated uh, in the sustainable development goals. Um, but those outcomes really kind of need to align all the way down to local outcomes. And when we're getting local outcomes which are aligned with the global outcomes, that's a good thing. This alignment is important uh, in outcomes. Oh, and saying it the other way around kind of illustrates it. You know, there's no point in doing something locally that doesn't help to achieve the global outcomes. You know, the, the alignment matters. But then it's how do we get to those outcomes? And this is showing the connection between the systems and the outcomes. Now, I'm spending a bit of time on this because I really want to emphasize the importance um, of the whole system. Uh, and what I'm illustrating here is that there's two systems, two key groups of systems that we can work with, um, the built systems and the natural systems. So if we're aiming for outcomes for people and nature, it kind of makes sense that we work with built and natural systems. But the connection, how we get to those outcomes, is really through the use of those systems. So use is really important. You know, this is where we get the value. It's the value from the use. OK, so I'm just, again, setting up the, the terms I want to use. Um, and then um, what we can see in the built systems is there's a whole load of processes um, that are relevant across those systems. At the center, I think, is use, because that's where we get the value from. But in order to make the assets and the systems available for use, we need to operate and maintain them effectively. And then every now and again, um, we do some kind of intervention on the system. Is that's adding some new assets, or possibly modifying what's already there, or potentially taking something away. But I think it's really helpful and instructive for us to see the whole system, and therefore to see our projects as interventions on that system. Now, the reason why that's important is because that's what we've got to play with in order to get better use, in order to get better outcomes. 
So if we, if we want better outcomes, really what we have to do is understand those systems better and intervene more effectively. And this is, uh, I think, the kind of the key point uh, at which I can then jump into the role of data and digital and using data and digital transformation to help us in exactly that, understanding the systems better and intervening more effectively. That's why I think it matters. Uh, but before I get there, I just wanted to ram home the point just a little bit more, if that's okay. Um, so first, it, it's just to use an illustration of the circular economy. I mentioned it briefly on the way through as one of these big kind of system level challenges. I think it's fascinating to look at the definitions which are emerging of the, the circular economy that also build on this point about use, that it's the use which is what we're aiming for. We're trying to get um, you know, maximizing the value of use of materials and products and assets and systems. Interestingly, where the circular economy has been developed elsewhere, like in white goods, it kind of stops at materials and products. It's saying use, you make, maximize the value of use of those. But in the built environment, because our products are incorporated into assets and the assets are incorporated into systems, we have a bigger part to play because it means that we need to use those systems um, and maximize the use of them, which is very similar to my previous slide. It's all about use. Okay, so how do we get to the outcomes? If we, if we are focused on outcomes, how do we get there? And I think that there is the potential for us to feel that what we do is some kind of project or an intervention, and then somehow, instantly, it gets to the better outcome. I, I don't think that's right. Uh, I think that projects and interventions deliver outputs. Uh, really, what they're doing is affecting the system in some way. And if we want to get to the outcomes, it's via the system. So I've kind of oversimplified this, but it's to make a, an important point. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll be coming back to it in data and uh, digital transformation. Um, for me, quite interestingly, um, that is completely out of scale. Because if we um, accept that the route to outcomes is from operating the systems better, and what we can do is intervene every now and again, it'd be interesting to know what the kind of the connection is. And um, you may have heard the statistic somewhere else that we already have 99.5% um, of the infrastructure systems that we need already. And each year, we add 0.5% to it. Now, that 0.5% really matters. It's something like 9% of GDP. You know, it, it, the construction industry seriously matters. Uh, however, if we put it to scale, um, it kind of looks like that when you look at the value. Uh, and so that kind of means that we, we kind of need to reset our, our thinking as to where to put the effort on getting the, the outcomes. So how does data and digital um, work on this? If, if what we want are these better outcomes and what we've got to play with are the systems um, and the interventions, uh, where does data and digital come in? Um, and I guess the simple question is, um, can data and digital help us? The answer is definitely yes, it definitely can. But it's quite useful, I think, to work out how to break it down. We need the data and digital transformation um, to transform delivery, you know, our projects, but also to transform the systems and also to transform all of the organizations uh, that are involved in it. So this is quite a big transformation we're talking about. And so you can see why I started with a big picture because it's the big picture that needs to get transformed. We're not just talking about transforming construction. Construction is part of the picture, it's not the whole picture. So what is data and digital transformation? I think um, at, its, at its heart, um, it's about enabling. We shouldn't do data and digital transformation because it's fun or because we can. Uh, it should always be because it's enabling something else, something else which is more important. You know, enabling us to move towards net zero, for example. So uh, data and digital is an enabler. Crucially, it's an enabler of people. People need to be at the heart of this. It's not about the machines taking over. Um, it's also a lot to do with information and making better decisions faster. And really, if we're not making better decisions faster, what kind of digital transformation was it? You know, that needs to be quite key. Uh, it enables us to improve processes. So it's not just taking what we used to do the old way and kind of turning it into a PDF. 
this enables us to completely challenge processes and change processes. And also, it enables us to um, I identify, apply and integrate technology more wisely. Because technology without a purpose is just a toy. What this enables us to do um, is integrate technology wisely with a purpose. The purpose being ultimately uh, to enable uh, people and nature to flourish together for generations. So I think those, those four things become really important in any digital transformation. People, information, processes and technology. Um, and if we just think of what is going to be digitalized, <clears throat> I've already done it with my simple circles and triangles, um, but here's the, the built environment back again, and here are the processes um, that I introduced um, briefly before. And if you kind of look at this and think, what needs to be digitally transformed, it's the whole thing. We're talking about a um, whole life cycle, a whole system, um, uh, that needs to be transformed, um, both the, the, the use but also delivery. And then also, all of this needs to be transformed. Um, every single part of the supply chain. And now I put owners at the center of that because it does seem that this machine, these cogs, which are all connected together, do somehow center around the owners. I think there's a, a special role um, of capable owners in driving uh, transformation. Uh, but basically, every organization uh, needs to go through some kind of transformation. If it doesn't, then the whole thing doesn't work. Um, and the key point I'd like to, to make here um, is that um, if it's not joined up, um, then it's not effective digital transformation. Uh, what, what really doesn't work is if every individual organization does their own digital transformation in a different way uh, and it doesn't connect. Th that is a, um, it's a silly thing to do, it's not creating value. So, so we should have in mind that when we talk about data and digital transformation of the built environment, it has to be joined up. It has to be a shared thing. Um, so the why, why should we do this? I hope I've given you some high level reasons why. It's because it can help us to understand the systems better, intervene more effectively because we want the outcomes. Um, but there are kind of more detailed reasons why. Um, and construction productivity is one which always comes up, doesn't it? We know, we can, we've seen this kind of graph um, forever. And we've done this horrible comparison and we see that construction productivity really hasn't improved over the years, whereas manufacturing has, and we beat ourselves over the head about it. Um, but it's not just about construction productivity, as I said, because we're looking at the whole thing. Um, we need to look bigger. Um, there's the national productivity picture. Unfortunately, that is just as bad. Uh, and you see that um, national productivity really hasn't moved very much uh, since the big crash in uh, 2008. Um, so the bigger issue here is not construction productivity, it's national productivity. So how do we get to that? Because it's no good just improving some of our construction processes. So we get back to my circles and, and squares, because I think that what we can do is overlay onto this um, those, those issues. If we want to improve national productivity, it's part of an outcome. If we want to improve construction productivity, it's down in the interventions. It's important, but it's not the whole picture. So how do we improve national productivity using our systems? Well, what we've got to do is improve the system's performance. And in order to improve the system's performance, we need to know what that performance is and need to know what levers we have to pull. But the thing is, if we want to improve national productivity, we won't get there just by tweaking construction productivity. That's, I feel, a really key point. Um, OK, so that's why do we need data and digital transformation. Um, I also want to just briefly cover why do we need a strategy? Well, part of the reason why we need a strategy for it um, is that the construction industry uh, consistently comes out as being the lowest in terms of um, digitalization. Um, this is a McKinsey, it's slightly out of date, but the, um, um, the answers are still the same. And the thing is that other industries have digitally transformed. They have done it to themselves. It has happened. But we've had the opportunity to transform digitally for at least 15 years, and it hasn't happened by itself. So the construction industry hasn't digitally transformed on its own. It needs to be joined up. As I said, you can't have everyone doing their own thing. Therefore, we need a strategy. And crucially, we need a strategy which will join it up 
and enable the industry to, to kick start. So I, I think this is at the heart of why we need a strategy. So we know why we need data and digital transformation. Now I'm trying to propose um, that it's the time because of all these big picture things, because we've got big cross system challenges, because we haven't digitally transformed ourselves, now is the time for us to put together um, a strategy, a joined up strategy for data and digital transformation. And that strategy needs to be outcomes focused because that's what we need. It needs to be systems based because that's how we can make the difference. And also it needs to be community enabled because at the moment we work in silos and we've got to break the silos. So these three things end up being core pillars um, of the transformation. So the mission, uh, should we choose to accept it, and I think we have to, um, is to accelerate this transformation in the built environment in order to improve outcomes for people and nature. You know, this, this seriously is what we have to do. And like I said at the beginning, I believe that we have the agency to make this work. Um, so the approach, how, how on earth would we go about doing it? So the first thing is to say, um, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm talking about boiling the ocean, I'm not. Uh, boiling the ocean isn't, isn't um, a good approach, so we're not going to do that. Uh, what we do need to do, though, is um, eat an elephant. So how do we chop the elephant up uh, into bite-sized chunks and, and make it all work? Well, there's an example. There's an example that has driven change, you know, turning things into bite-sized chunks and making a real difference. So I'm not going to spend a long time on this. I guess people in the room will have heard of Project 13, uh, a whole different way of delivery, uh, which kind of moves from traditional transactions and trying to push uh, risk down the supply chain into a much more enterprise-based approach, which is about um, an ecosystem of a capable owner and their supplier, uh, their suppliers working together together, integrated, focused on outcomes. Um, and it works. Um, it's proven. It works. Um, there's a number of different pillars within this. Um, I see Miles and Simon over there kind of smiling at me. I could um, uh, plug some of, of their recent publications in there. But I'm just pointing out digital transformation down the bottom there um, as an enabler of this. Early on, it was recognized that digital transformation would be a key enabler um, of um, Project 13, but also that Project 13 is an enabler of digital transformation because it's about bringing um, organizations together um, focused on outcomes. Um, an awful lot of um, leading client organizations um, are behind this. This is um, the kind of membership of the infrastructure client group. Uh, I already mentioned how important the capable owner would be in, uh, in the machine, the cog that you turn that turns all the other cogs. Um, and representatives of this have come together to focus on digital transformation. Uh, so we have some experience of what works. And one thing which we found to work is incredibly simple. It's just three things which you just do reliably again and again, and it drives transformation. The first one is about benchmarking, or a route map. Putting, sorry, the first one is about a route map, is um, understanding what to do first, prioritizing, knowing where you're trying to get to. Benchmarking, it's providing a dial, because if you don't have a dial, you can't shift the dial. Um, and then sharing, a crucial part of identifying good practice, sharing it, enabling it to be adopted. Now, I feel almost embarrassed saying these three things because they're so obvious, um, but this is, what, this is what actually drives change and makes it very doable. Um, when it comes to the route maps, something that, just a, a little thing which seems to unlock it for people, um, is the idea of having a three horizon route map uh, because uh, I think a lot of the industry um, is focused in horizon one. It's the now stuff because now is important. There's a lot to get on with. You know, we, we need to be grabbing those low hanging fruit and the quick outcomes and people want that. And you know, there's, there's things to react to today which are really important. So you know, horizon one is really important a really important thing, and I'm not going to denigrate it at all. However, if all we do is focus on the now incremental changes, those incremental changes won't get us to the d destination we need that I talked about at length earlier on. So we need the Horizon 3. Horizon 3 is a new paradigm. It's a paradigm within which 
um, there is much more connection. There's interoperability. You've got um, different organisations working to, to the, the same kind of um, same kind of approaches. So that if you mix it up for a different project, it comes together m more easily. Your know, Horizon Three is different and better. Uh, but so often, the discussion about Horizon 3 seems to be a problem in Horizon 1. So it's good to parse them out and make a distinction. Horizon 2 is really about the transition. So Horizon 3 is a much better place. <coughs> Horizon 1 is where we are and the incremental changes. But Horizon 2 is the, um, is the transition. And it's interesting, important, I think, that each of the f more future horizons informs the one before. So that means that when we're getting on and doing some important now stuff in Horizon 1, it's with a direction, it's with the end in mind. Rather than it just being kind of random improvements, it's improvements um, which has direction. Uh, and then, interest well, not interesting, um, importantly, um, there's feedback the other way, because as we move through these, we learn, which then means that Horizon 3 doesn't stay the same. It's informed by uh, what actually happens. Um, you could be calling these um, develop, translate, and adopt. The biggest challenge, I think, in our industry to data and digital transformation um, is not actually about the new stuff. The biggest challenge is about adopting the good practice that already exists. If our industry were to adopt the good practice that already exists, it would be transformatory, um, but we don't do that. Another thing is just, again, putting the scale on this, um, as I did with my triangles. Um, uh, in reality, Horizon 1 is the much bigger thing. So we don't have to spend a huge amount, an inordinate amount of time just thinking about vision. Um, you know, these, these things fit together. Uh, however, we must consider Horizon 3. Otherwise, we'll be just be going around in circles on Horizon 1. OK, I said I would touch on digital twins. Because we've, we've done the big picture, why we need the digital transformation, why it's such a good idea. Uh, we've done the, the thing that actually we need a strategy for this and it needs to be joined up. And now I've got a little bit, and I'll be quite quick on this, um, which will focus in on one of those really exciting things that sits in Horizon 3. Um, and if you are m kind of mired in Horizon 1 just now, um, don't listen to me thinking that I'm going to stop you doing what you're doing. It's really important. I'm just saying that the Horizon 3 and this stuff about digital twins is uh, one of the directions that we can go in. So a digital twin, quite simply, um, and, and hopefully in an um, accessible way, is a, a means of making a connection between the physical and digital world. So with a Formula One car, you've got the Formula One car, which zooms around at great, great speeds, um, actually feeding a whole load of data into a digital version of that car that sits in the pit lane. Uh, and in the pit lane, um, they are analysing that data, and the data comes from all sorts of different angles. You know, there's sensors on the car, but also sensors on the driver, um, and that enables them to uh, make decisions and drive interventions. So, so the, um, you, the the stuff that's going on in an information world is that you've got data going one way, helping being modelled, generating insights, leading to the decisions which drive interventions, hopefully leading to better outcomes. Um, and so the kind of um, decisions which are being made here is around engine management or fuel management or when to bring the car in for, for a tyre change. You know, that's the type of thing which is relevant here. Um, and uh, the, the essence of this and what makes it a digital twin is this two-way connection, um, connecting physical and digital data going one way and interventions going the other. So that's what a digital twin is in, in simple terms. But you can apply it all over the place. This, is, this becomes really, um, really interesting across um, infrastructure and the built environment. Um, so if we, if we generalise it um, and now just talk about anything which is in the physical world that could potentially have a, a digital twin of it, um, you can see that um, there are ways that there are ways of integrating technology to make this, uh, make this work from sensors, IoT, 5G, uh, the data management platforms, um, various different ways of doing, doing modelling, um, visualisation, the decision support tools, robotics. So really, digital twins, I don't think, are a technology. It's much more of an approach, uh, and it's an approach which integrates other technology with a purpose, which is very much uh, what I was saying earlier on. Um, the core 
uh, value of a digital twin is it enables people to make better decisions faster. That's really the, the heart of it. Uh, and most digital twins um, are, have something to do with that. You can have a digital twin of assets or processes or systems. Uh, because you can have a digital twin of processes, that means you can have a digital twin of a supply chain or a digital twin of an organization or a digital twin of an economy if you wanted. Um, and within the digital twin, um, there's almost always something to do with managing the data. There's some kind of modeling at the heart of it and then some kind of visualization to enable us to have, have a look in. Uh, but all of those things uh, need to be driven by purpose. We should never do a digital twin because it's fun or because we can. We should do a digital twin because there's a very clear purpose and the purpose will then define everything else in there, like the data refresh rate or the fidelity of the model. Um, so that kind of in outline is a, a, a digital twin. Um, we can apply it to pretty much anything you can imagine um, in the built environment. So here it's applied to a train. Um, and the type of thing that you could have on a train is just a very simple digital twin um, that, for example, uh, would take data from an acoustic sensor on a door. Um, it would run a comparison between that acoustic signature and what you expect the noise of a door to make. And if it starts making a slightly strange noise, you put it in for, um, for maintenance before the, the door breaks uh, because you can hear something going wrong or the, the AI can hear something going wrong weeks in advance of the door actually breaking, uh, which would be very good because the number of times I've been forced to get off the train um, at Stevenage, uh, it's always Stevenage, uh, because a door has broken uh, it is, is no longer funny. So um, you've got an individual digital twin for, um, for a train or even just a train door. Um, but you can also have a digital twin um, of the track and digital twin of the signaling. Um, and you know, I, I would love to dig in a little bit more detail as to what those digital twins might do separately. But in the physical world, um, they are all joined up, obviously, because a train goes on the track past the, past the signals. What becomes really quite interesting in the digital twin world is that you can start to imagine making connections between the digital twins. And so this is getting one digital twin to talk to another one. Um, and if we can imagine that, uh, then we can start to imagine an ecosystem of connected digital twins. And so we're, we're back now with our system. You know, here we are back in the built environment and all around the built environment you can see these digital twins uh, popping up and they are popping up by the way. The annual growth rate um, of the digital twin market is 50% a year. So this is, this is happening. Um, and then you can have the connections between the digital twins, having them talk to each other. And when I say digital twin talk to another digital twin, the language they speak is a data language. It's just sharing data across organizational and sector boundaries. But that is an amazing way of breaking silos. Because if you want to break a silo, one of the best ways of doing it is to get an information flow across the silo boundary. This is one of those ways. So with digital twins, we instantly start to have a way of making better decisions faster at an individual digital twin level. When you make an ecosystem of them, then you can start to understand systems better and intervene more effectively, which is what we said, I don't know, about 30 minutes ago, uh, which is what we said we wanted. Um, and this isn't just theory. Um, I, I was the... Uh, previous head of the National Digital Twin Program. Uh, we tested this stuff out. Uh, this is uh, imagery coming from um, the Credo project, which is a climate resilience demonstrator project. We had three different sectors that we looked at, uh, water, energy, and telecoms. They're all connected to each other because the water, water assets go down. If the energy assets go down, they go down. If the telecoms assets go down. And so having this information flow across sector boundaries uh, was shown to enable better resilience decisions. Um, and uh, we did a very nice video of that if you want to see. It's very accessible. OK, so I come, I come to the end. Um, it was a very quick scoot through the, the digital twins. Forgive me if it, if it was a bit too quick, but we've got questions, so you can come back to it. Uh, but the reason for me doing that was to show uh, that there's stuff in Horizon 3, which is starting to happen now, which is really relevant uh, to what we talked about before for um, the, kind of the solutions we need at a systems level. Um, and so I guess what I wanted to just conclude on here um, was to say that um, th this is a very doable thing. You know, what we really need to, to be doing now is to be joining up. Um, we need to have 
um, solutions that are definitely outcomes focused because that's what we want. They need to be systems enabled, which means we need to understand the systems better and intervene more effectively. A really key way of doing that is through a joined up data and digital transformation. That requires a strategy uh, and uh, that's up to us to make it happen, but it's doable. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> now, I knew this was going to be good, but it's so inspirational what you're talking about. And you're talking about it to an audience of a generation beneath us that is going to be the key to getting this right. And they're going to do it. They are. So thank you for that. Now, whilst you're all thinking of questions, there are mics around. Um, I'm going to sort of be doing a bit of spotting. A couple of things I want to tell you about Mark that you won't be surprised by now. He got an OBE for services to engineering. That is a huge deal. In the private sector, to do something like that, big, big respect. And you're also a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, another very rare thing. So it's, it's brilliant that you've, you, you've been achieving these outstanding things, which, again, will inspire the students here to do the same. So 20, 30 years' time, you could be here doing this. Right, questions. Do we have any? Because I have some if you don't. Right, you were very quick. Well done. Thank you so much for the, for the presentation. I have a question around the outcomes, because I, I do find it fascinating to think about the infrastructure in terms of outcomes. But maybe if you can unpack a bit more uh, how we did think about the outcomes at the systems level, and I guess outcomes for whom, because different um, elements in your kind of uh, coggles, isn't it, will have different uh, priorities and, and different outcomes. And then maybe where's the role of digital twin in that process? Because exchanging information doesn't necessarily lead to a decision, especially not the decision around the outcomes set at the systems level. So if you can unpack that a bit more, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important thing for us to wrestle with. So um, I, I certainly can't give a kind of a perfect answer to that, but just parts of the answer. So for me, um, when it comes to those outcomes, uh, they will almost inevitably be some kind of connection, so some kind of combination um, of environmental, social and economic outcomes. You know, that, that, that's kind of the, the space that we're, uh, we're working in. I mentioned the SDGs before because that's a nice measurable way of, of seeing outcomes at, at quite a high level. Um, but I think that with that idea of the alignment going all the way through from kind of a, a global outcomes which you're aiming for, through to kind of national and local outcomes. Um, I think that um, there's always going to be some kind of combination of um, environmental, social and economic. The balance between those, my view, um, is something that needs to be got at um, through an intensely democratic process. Uh, you know, this is not um, just um, a kind of a technocratic, press a button on a digital twin, it will tell you the answer. I think that with the outcomes being the thing that drives us, that's where the people should be. You know, this is something that needs to be discussed. Uh, it need, you know, we need a very broad engagement. There needs to be uh, you know, um, arguments and uh, disagreements and getting to a point you know, through you know, the, the amazing, messy process that democracy is. Um, to get to a point of saying this is the balance that we actually want as, as this community, which could either be the local community, national community, kind of global community. Uh, and then once we've got those, um, those outcomes as kind of the objective function, then we can start playing with the levers of our systems in order to deliver those outcomes. So, so the key part of my answer here is that it's going to be some kind of combination of those things, but I think the route to getting the right balance um, is, is through engagement and discussion. Thank you. So more questions? Uh, Melanie. Uh, 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 absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, coordination is uh, incredibly important. Um, but you have different interest groups, don't you? And to me, I suppose the question is, you've got business and you've got government. You also have cost. So how much is this going to add to cost? And what, in terms of years, will be the payback? Because we all know if it's too far to get the payback, government gets stuck in what's going to happen in the next two weeks. 
There's a lot in that question. <laughs> um, so the first thing on the on the coordination, um, I think that that this thing that we're talking about um, is way too big to control. Um, and uh, you're just looking at the different organisations which would be involved. Um, the answer, I am sure, is not to set up some kind of king of the castle with some, uh, some kind of command and control structure that, that forces everybody underneath it to, to do something. You know, that, that there's no way that that could possibly work. Um, however, I do think that convening, connecting, coordinating across a number of key stakeholders um, has, a, has a much better chance of... Um, of working, so so I think that there's a you know there's a, an approach to um, coordination which is is really important there, um, and it's it's about bringing people um, with skills together. I think you're exactly right to point to the kind of the key big different parties. So there's industry, government, academia, um, and those three kind of need to work together. Um, I think if we're honest, when we look at any one of those three at the moment, if you kind of look inside the box, um, there's an awful lot of silos going on. So there's the need for convening, connecting, coordinating within those, but also a across them. Um, so that, there's a, just a few thoughts there on the coordination part of it. When it comes to the, um, the savings and the cost, um, I think that this is a super interesting place to dig into. Because if we... Um, genuinely care about the outcomes for people and nature, then it's not just about cost, it's about value. And I think that we kind of need to change the, uh, the, the language a bit to focus on, on value, because that's the language of outcomes. Inevitably, when it comes to um, interventions, there's cost, uh, but it needs to be in the context of the much bigger picture um, of, of value. Uh, and what I guess we all know uh, is that you know, sometimes you can end up saving a little bit of cost today, uh, but destroying value mm. for the future. So that's what we've got to get better at wrestling with. OK. Um, brilliant. I, so we've got so many questions. I'm going to try and keep the questions brief and then quick answers if you can. Sure. And then we can get lots in. Thank you. Th thank you very much. And um, I've learned a lot from this lecture. My main question was to, do, to, to keep it brief, is to do about how you get this data and what are the laws and regulations around the data and does it infringe our security to have all of these systems and these silos broken? Because I understand the silos are probably put up as companies and people trying to protect their own data because data is now something that you can sell from one company to another. And I was wondering how you are going to bring about this connection if there is so much regulation within the data industry. <laughs> there's so much in that question too. I'll, I'll try and be brief for the answer. So I, I feel there's three, three parts for me to the, uh, the answer to that. So on the data laws and, and regulations, um, we really need to advance those, but advance them um, as enablers of the type of thing we're talking about rather than as blockers. Uh, and very often what we see um, is that um, there are human and organisational factors that get in the way of, um, of these solutions. Um, so uh, we characterise the National Digital Twin Programme as a socio-technical change programme because we recognise that the technical solution was necessary but not sufficient. It was actually the easy bit. The difficult bit is all the human stuff. Uh, and that means putting in place commercial, regulatory, legal solutions. Um, so th those kind of data laws and regulations are super important, uh, but they should be seen as enablers. Um, then when it comes to the security bit, um, I would argue it almost the other way round. Um, that um, how secure do you reckon a, a system is um, if you can't have information flow across it? You know, the, the right information flowing to the right people, we're actually making it less secure. So we need to kind of see, again, the, the bigger picture and the outcome and the value. Um, security is incredibly important, but what that doesn't mean is that you just lock everything down. It means that you've got to get the right information to the right people at the right time to make the right decision. And, and that is actually a more secure solution. Um, and then, uh, yeah, on the selling of, of data, the la last point you made, um, you're right. There's a behaviour um, um, out there in the, in the wide world that, that kind of knows that data is valuable and therefore they think, OK, what we'll do is protect our data because I could sell it. Um, that is kind of the wrong thing to do. <laughs> because um, it, you know, it's quite short-sighted, because there's more value in sharing the data than there is in keeping it and selling it. So again, we come back to this issue about um, value and, and cost. 
uh, and, the, and the kind of thing I was talking about, of kind of the interoperability across many systems, just, just imagine what the value of that is. Uh, that's what we need to move towards, rather than thinking, I'm going to save myself tuppence halfpenny on the data that I keep to myself. Like, Brilliant. Yeah, I think that just kind of struggles me about that, is I think more people think in the posterior way than the ulterior way. It's true. Thank you. We, we are, I've been hogging this side. We've got a question over there. Yes. Uh, thank you. An outstanding presentation indeed. You have covered so many subjects that I could talk for hours myself. But I just relate to one slide, which was packed with details, where you were talking about productivity. And I agree with everything what you said there. But unfortunately, since you are talking uh, about systemic issues, this is a metasystemic mm, uh, issue. This is about how we are governed, that we are delivering productivity much, much lower than our counterparts. We know that this is the, uh, not just the, uh, low investment. This is the secondary issue. Low investment comes that we have short termists. And we have short termists because we have first past the post system, which uh, puts a premium on people staying in power for decades. But if you look across the channel, one of the reasons that the productivity is there higher is that you've got choice. We do not have choice. I don't want to go into the politics. I'll only give you one final proof that in 1990, we were 18th country in terms of GDP per capita. Now we are 36. Germany was there below us, 16. There are 26, but in the meantime, they took 17 millions of East Germans into the West Germany. This is how bad the system, uh, the, the system works, and this is a metasystemic thing. Any, anyway, I really <laughs> congratulate you for your analysis, and I agree with everything you said. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so what can I say to that? I mean, thank you very much. For, for, yeah. but, um, you, you could escape with that just being a statement. OK, I'll, I'll stay with that. There was just one thing I wanted to say about the, sh the short-termism. Um, I think that that is um, uh, a, a hugely important observation, uh, and it feels as if uh, we have moved into a, a space where we are almost completely reactive uh, and don't think ahead, uh, and the short-termism has become a serious problem. So what I'm advocating here of a, a, a proper joined up strategy uh, is kind of the antithesis of that. It's saying, actually, let's think ahead because we can imagine a better future. Then let's work out what we have to do to get to that better future rather than just constantly reacting to whatever the next crisis is. So right. I agree with you. Okay. Um, right, lots of questions. There's, there's one um, quite far at the back. Yeah, got you. And then we'll come over this side. Uh, hello. If, if this is a personal question, and it's more your opinion. If you were the head of a venture capital evaluating uh, promising companies to help uh, the digitalization of construction, where will you put your money, or which <laughs> sector <laughs> will will you see the most yeah. promising? Okay. Um, it's a great question. And the first thing is that no venture capitalist would let me anywhere near them because um, you know, they deal with money and I deal with ideas. Um, but it is a good question because it kind of gets to the, the heart of where the value is. And I think that some of the greatest value uh, will be um, on uh, enabling interoperability. So I, I talked about individual digital twins. And they have huge value in themselves. And I already said, a 50% growth rate. Uh, you know, the digital twins are happening. Um, the issue is that we can spot um, a market failure a mile off, and that's a failure to federate. Uh, that, that there's a real danger now that the digital twins won't talk to each other. So um, if I were a venture capitalist, uh, and there were um, some kind of organization that was setting itself up to enable that information flow, a secure, resilient information flow across organizational sector boundaries, uh, that would be an absolute surefire bet for unlocking a huge amount of value. Um, you know, in some ways, I wish I was more of an entrepreneur, because I could set that company up, uh, and then I'd be amazing. Um, but as it is, I can see the need for it, but I can't do anything about it. Are you a venture capitalist? <laughs> OK, not yet. Right, how are we doing? Um, thank you. 
Uh, thank you for that lecture. It was brilliant. Um, I just want to touch upon the three systems. So you've got delivery systems and organizations all have to have the whole digital transformation piece. How do you incentivize organizations who compete in the marketplace to work together mm. uh, uh, so that they all work towards the same strategy and same aim rather than all working in individual silos? Thank you. Oh, you've got some really good questions coming up here. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Okay, yeah. so <clears throat> I think that um, this thing about incentives for organisations to change is, is huge because they won't change unless there is an incentive, unless there's a really good reason to, to do it. Uh, and I, I think one of the biggest ones is actually to do with value and the value of data. Um, so ju just imagine that you're an investor uh, or an insurance company looking into an organisation. doesn't matter what it is. It's you know, some organisation involved somewhere in, in delivery. Uh, and you see that that organisation um, is an absolute shower. They've got no idea what data they have or where it is. It's a complete and utter mess. You look at another completely equivalent organisation, the only difference is that actually they have really got their hands around the data. They know exactly what, you know, what's there. They've kind of got a, a proper inventory of the, of the value of data. They're even poten potentially thinking about um, evaluating it and kind of getting it somehow on their, on their, um, um, on their balance sheet. So, so which of those do you think is uh, more investable or more insurable? And, and my, my view is that as soon as we get investors and insurers to see the genuine value of properly managed data, and then they say, I am not going to invest in your project or in your company unless you sort out your data, that will drive change. That, that, you know, that, that change will be enormous. That, that will give you the incentive for organisations to organise their data properly and manage information effectively. Um, but your question wasn't that. Your question was, how do you get them to work together? And so I think that um, to get them to work together um, is a nice, clever little nuance. Because if you're um, getting different organisations to go through their own digital transformation and they're getting their act together with respect to data, um, if they're following the same basic data rules, in other words, having um, consistent high-quality data models and they've also got shared reference data, it means that they don't have to think about working with the other, they do it automatically because they're, they're already getting the data in an order, which means that you can have the interoperability. So in, in some ways, it's just having the bigger view uh, and, and people will um, end up uh, being able to work together uh, almost unawares. Right. We've probably got room for maybe one or two questions. Just, just to add to that last point, Project 13, have a look at it, because so much of that is about how you get the interfaces between businesses going better. Right, um, we'll have one more from this side. Go. Uh, Mark, Andrew Wilson, many thanks for a fantastic presentation. And can I just say thank you for the huge contribution you've made to this whole uh, subject over many, many, many years. So that's great. Look, I, was, I, I like your um, sort of connected network of cogs. And I agree that actually it's very difficult to know which cog starts first in order for everyone else to work. But assuming that the client is in the centre and has the ability to buy from the market solutions, what three bits of advice would you give to clients on Monday morning to start getting those cogs going? Mm. Um, I might not come up with exactly three, but um, I think one of the, the, the key things would be to do with that um, three horizon route map. I think that three horizon route maps make a lot of sense at a number of different levels. So we talked about the national level. Uh, but it also kind of makes sense at, at um, a kind of a sector level because you can imagine there being enough similarity across infrastructure clients that there should be something shared between them. Likewise, enough similarity across housing, for example, for there to be some sh a, a shared route map. Uh, but then within an individual organisation, it also makes sense to have the same, same approach. So I think my number one bit of advice would be to you know, get yourself a really good three horizon route map. Um, I think another, another part of it would be to, um, to see um, the value of data. We sl slightly talked about it just, just now, but at the moment, my observation is um, that the realization of the value of data hasn't really hit boardrooms yet. Um, there are some notable exceptions, and I'm not sure if I should you know, name names, uh, but there are some really notable, exciting exceptions 
uh, where the value of data is recognised in the boardroom and it's transformed the kind of conversations. So I, I think those would probably be my top two. Uh, I'll come up with a third before Monday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, William. Uh, wonderful lecture. I thought I was at the age I wouldn't learn anymore, but I've learned an awful lot tonight. <laughs> With the proliferation of digital twins, which seems to be the way we're going, and you're applauding, I have concerns about cybersecurity. You know, take a simple one of sensors on the train going back uh, to a central point and then getting uh, changes as a result of it. That data is hacked. You could have a potentially serious problem. And this is, that's just a very, a very simple example, but I see that data security and checking of your data as you receive it is absolutely vital. Yes, so I, I completely agree. I think you're, you're exactly right. Cybersecurity really is a, a, a serious issue um, that all of us and all the organisations we, we work for should, should take as one of the highest priorities. Um, you, you, so you're absolutely right. Um, I think that there are approaches which enable uh, this kind of secure, resilient information sharing that I, I talk about. And one of the most important ones um, is about where the data actually sits. Um, so one way of sharing data would be, you know, if you and I wanted to share data, uh, we could put it in a, a database that was somewhere between us. You put a copy of your data in it, I put a copy of my data in it, we both get access to the same database, and that way we've shared data. Um, that's not very secure because who owns the database, who looks after it. Another way of doing it is that you, you keep your data, your side of your organisational boundary and your, your firewall, and you give me access, um, a kind of controlled access to controlled data. You don't give me access to all your data, you give me access to the bit that you allow me to have access to, but you still own that data, so you still look after it. So that kind of approach, we think, is much, intrinsically much more secure, um, but that doesn't get away from the, your... Really important point. Cybersecurity is a big issue, whatever. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to sneak in one more because um, there's Sam Bedetti who's going to have a question there and he works at a wonderful firm. That's another story. Um, William, I should also spot, point out, William and Stephen there and actually Nick are the power behind the lectures before today. So they, they were the organisers behind this and it's brilliant, Nick, to have you um, back here today. Thank you for, for that. <laughs> uh, right, Sam, quick question. Thank you very much, Mark. Great, better, better be great good. Talk. Um, you mentioned a big challenge around adopting the good practice that we've already got in the industry. And, and then there's something about community enablement. And I really agree that we need to you know, enable the community that we've already got. What do um, governments, uh, the, uh, sorry, yeah, governments, academia, and industry, what do those three? Um, parts need to do to, to get the good practice adopted today? Um, I mean, fundamentally, it's worked together um, in an intelligent um, way which is headed towards an agreed Horizon 3. So, so you know, there, there's a, this element of um, just coordinating across those, those three. Um, but each one has a specific role to play uh, and can do, do stuff that the others can't. Um, one of the things which uh, I think I've discovered, and I... I'm in danger now, aren't I? Because this, this isn't four walls, it's bigger. But um, I think what I observe is, is that quite often for the kind of change we're talking about here, um, it doesn't get led by government. Uh, there has to be some kind of movement in that direction already, and then government will detect it uh, and turn it into policy. So I don't think that what we should do is wait until government says, do this... Um, you know, joined up digital transformation strategy because we might be waiting a long time. Um, so you know, there are things which government is good at and things which government does does differently. So I I think that actually this kind of joined up digital transformation strategy for the built environment uh, actually needs to start in industry and academia. And when we start to get our act together, um, government will definitely be interested. Okay, um, we probably need to wrap up this this side of things. John May is going to do a, a thank you to you very quickly while he's coming up here. A um, couple of things. Well done for the question, Sam. Sam is a really good example of recent distinction from your Masters at Imperial. Isn't that cool? Um, so, encouraging employers to help their, their people develop that. Um, the other thing I want to say, 
we also should thank Mott McDonald because it's incredibly yeah. nice of them to put their time into this. These things don't happen without a lot of time behind it. So um, please take that back to Mott's. We're lucky to have them being so supportive. I'll get yeah. out of the way. You've got something very short to say, I think. I have. <laughs> OK. <laughs> thank you. Um, our support for the, uh, the, the uh, lecture here comes through the Pavia's charity and we put a lot of our effort into uh, supporting education and thank you Mark for a most com completely fascinating lecture. Um, as a mere lawyer, I can only uh, stand back and uh, uh, admire what you've been telling us. Um, as paviers, um, we understand that um, uh, the built environment um, is uh, our starting point and that uh, construction represents 9% uh, of gross, gross domestic product. But what you've shown us today is to, to see the future as a system of systems. Um, and um, that uh, data and digital transformations uh, can be joined up and um, enabled. How we achieve this in a democratic engagement is one of those things that will appear, but our aim has to be an outcome-focused, system-based and community-enabled future. And to get there, we solve the enormous range of problems the way that we eat an elephant one slice at a time. Um, uh, so thank you very much indeed, Mark, for that. Thank you also to the others who have uh, made today happen, starting with uh, Professor Washington Ochieng. Um, uh, I know he doesn't want to hang around, and as I see that the President of Kenya has appointed him as an elder of the Order of the Burning Spear, um, I don't intend to uh, push my luck by staying here very long. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Washington, for, your, for what you have done for us and to your colleagues uh, and the most impressive range of students, some of whom we've started to meet and hope to see more of later. And thank you, Miles Ashley, for the, what you have done for the Paviors and for making this something very special today. Um, uh, the lecture... The lecture is, uh, is one of uh, our educational um, contributions during the year. We also support um, Arkwright Scholars, and some of those who we support are here with us today. Um, we provide some support for the uh, uh, Construction Youth Trust, and at a more basic level, the London Construction Academy, which changes lives by bringing people into the building industry at a much more humble level than yourselves. But all, all in all, we go home um, better informed and educated, and we're extremely grateful. Thank you all for coming, joining in, and giving it your attention and support. And we look forward to the 48th lecture. Uh, what can I say? Uh, a tour de force. Thank you very much, um, Mark. That was fantastic. I mean, we are indeed privileged and honored to host uh, this annual event. Uh, just a few thank yous uh, before we close. Um, obviously, Neil's team um, has done a wonderful job with us over the years, and he has already mentioned some of our colleagues who have been involved before. So thank you, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to mention uh, our team here at Imperial College, uh, a wonderful team led by Alexandra Williams. Where, where are you? Over there. And, and this year, we decided to mix it up a little bit. So uh, some of you have been uh, before the, the actual presentation to the boss area, the second floor. We have had some presentations. Um, and that will be continuing after this. So please, if you allow me, let me mention some of our colleagues who have been involved there. Uh, Pelin, uh, Felix. Wu Zhangju, uh, Panagiotis Angeludis, Andy Clark, Fura Naim, Jessica Andrews, Michael Bashford, Eduardo Rico, uh, Javier Sanchez, Iptihal Ahmed, Toby Greenwood, Oli Kelland, Ali Nicole, uh, Tim Gordon, our graduate teaching assistants who have helped us, and last but not least, our own, our very own Dr. Sandy Popola. Where are you? sitting over there. So thank you very, very much to uh, our team. So there are more... <laughs> there are more drinks and there are more presentations in the boss area on the second floor, so please join us 
for a continued celebration of a wonderful occasion. Thank you very much indeed, and God bless.